Hi everyone, I'm here to talk today about short selling outside of the US and the opportunities that can present. So while people who have seen the chopping block and some of the other featured activists uh, on our platform, you'll notice that a lot of it seems to be pretty US centric, but actually there is a whole world outside of the US that is interesting both from a regular short selling side and also an activist short selling side. And in fact, we've often felt because of the somewhat saturation of short selling in the US, that foreign markets can be sometimes a better source of alpha on the short side than they are in the US. Now, while that holds true, there are de very different regulatory requirements outside of the US. Some of these relate to disclosed short selling positions. Others relate to what you are now um, allowed to do with respect to talking to formers or information that you might be allowed to look at in the US, which you're actually forbidden from looking at and will be classed as MMPI in foreign jurisdictions. There's also very different execution type challenges. Um, liquidity is not as abundant in certain developed and emerging markets as it is in the US. And in addition to that, the availability of stock borrows, specifically in markets like Asia and Southeast Asia, can present real challenges. But once you're over all of that, you also got to think about whether if you're based in the US, you really fancy staying up till 3 a.m. in the morning to trade a stock that might be listed in Germany or France. And my experience is, unless the juice is worth the squeeze, it's probably better to sleep well at night. Over the years, we at Muddy Waters um, started kind of in the reverse merger Chinese space and actually saw that the dysfunctions that were prevalent within US markets also were prevalent in Singapore, Hong Kong, parts of Europe as well. So we over the years have moved our focus from being solely US to probably about somewhere between 30 and 50% of what we're doing now is outside of the US. And there's a few things we really look for when we're going after non-US companies. One of the things we find very interesting is kind of the concept of regulatory arbitrage. So these are companies that might be listed on a, an exchange, potentially a junior exchange within a larger um, developed market, but the entire business might be based in an emerging market or a completely different developed market. Now, there can be good reasons for that. So there are lots of companies that list in the US, for example, because they want a market with better liquidity and you know a deeper um, base of investors who might be prepared to buy that stock. And that's perfectly fine. But what is problematic is when you see companies where perhaps the main listing is in Germany, the business is largely based in Russia, and they're using an auditor in Poland. And the reason that companies would do something like that is if you have separate parts of the business all in different places and an investor base that's quite divorced from the realities and it makes it very difficult to diligence the business on the ground, you're potentially able to pull the wool over the eyes of the investor base, which gives you more latitude for wrongdoing. It's not just happening in Europe. Um, there are numerous cases in Australia of interesting US tech companies that went to list in Australia. And I think one of the dynamics that can be interesting in, in markets like Australia and Canada, these were both markets where you had a significant concentration of investors in resources. You had a significant concentration of people who looked at financials, so insurers, banks, maybe utilities. And between that, there was very little research coverage of pretty much everything else. So you end up with banking being very concentrated on the industries that pay the most banking fees. The large fund managers very concentrated in terms of their exposure and their experience, looking at the more traditional companies, and then a whole hodgepodge of bits and pieces in the middle, which really run the gamut of schemes and scams, um, which allow for more excitement and aggressive promotional tactics.
So those are markets that we find very interesting because of that dynamic. Moving to continental Europe, something we find particularly interesting is the amount of disclosure that's actually provided with local filings. So for most European companies, they are of a, once they're of a certain size, they file um, pretty extensive accounts for all their subsidiaries, which enables you to go in and build up a picture of how the underlying business units might be doing, which will potentially be much more granular than what you would get looking at the segment disclosures within a larger business or potentially how they might break it out within consolidated accounts. Another thing we find about Europe is, generally speaking, us Europeans, we're a little less aggressive than Americans. And so as a result, there's, I think, less of a culture of sharp elbowed questioning. And because of that, you end up with lots of fund managers who are actually very aware of the dysfunction that takes place below the line. But because there is not a culture of openly questioning that, you end up with a scenario where everyone sort of says to each other, look, we all know this is going on. We potentially know this business is not quite as good as it appears to be. But if no one calls it out and questions it, it's probably going to remain the status quo. And looking back at names that we've looked at, a couple that really stand out are, are NMC and Burford Capital. Now, Burford Capital was a litigation financing business with um, fairly opaque accounting. And one of the things that we thought was extremely well known and was actually disclosed by the company was that having gone through a number of CFOs, the CFO at the time we wrote our report was actually the CEO's wife. And it was really amazing to me how many fund managers um, found that to be shocking. Going back to the NMC case, uh, which is a company we published on and has actually been largely realized to be a fraud, we were quite amazed that even though most fund managers knew that the margins were significantly better than the peers and were really unable to explain it, they found it very difficult to make the link between margins being problematic and out of line with peers and the potential for that to mean there's fraud within the company. So the reactions to short reports really do vary significantly by jurisdiction. Within the US, I think the prevalence of high frequency trading and the amount of passive money can often really blunt the impact of a short report. Um, I think there are instances where there's excellent work that's been produced and because of the way that high frequency trading works, you, you get this sort of dip and then the stock bounces back. And by the time the analyst has run over to PM to say, hey, XYZ has published a short report on our name, I'm pretty sure the PM's first question is how much is the stock down? And the analyst says, oh, it was down eight, and now it's recovered, it's down two. And I, I think in a bizarre way, the price actually feedbacks um, and really allows the PM to have a sense of false confidence. Europe's very different. Despite there not being as much liquidity day-to-day -day in Europe and short reporting rules that mean you have to disclose above a 50 basis points position, typically the impact of short reports is much greater. And I think that goes back to the lack of generally critical information that is published on companies and potentially significant complacency amongst the fund management community. Um, Asia is a whole different ballgame. Um, Hong Kong specifically it's become a real Mickey Mouse of a market. Um, I think you only have to look back to the response to reports on um, China Hongqiao, where the company was suspended and then China Citic put in a facility to basically give companies the ability to access cash to buy their stock up, to jam the stock higher, and basically make Hong Kong a no-go market for short sellers. Um, and I think that's really to the detriment of their capital markets. And I think increasingly it's a problem because not only is it quashing freedom of speech, 
but you really discourage any sort of critical information from ever being circulated as the incentives to do so for activist short sellers basically don't exist. I think one of my most formative experiences when I first got into the business was I came in one morning and uh, one of the large Korean chaebols had just admitted that they had a four, five, six hundred million dollar slush fund that had been discovered and I was expecting the stock to be limit down. And lo and behold, I, I don't even think uh, the stock was down on the day. You know, while in the US, a large corporate admitting it had a three or five hundred million dollar slush fund would probably be page one of the FT. You have to adjust for the cultural nuances. So looking at a market like Hong Kong, if you were to say that a company had overstated its margins by 10, 20, even 30 percent, I'm not sure you're telling investors anything they don't already know. Versus in Europe, I think the bar is much lower in terms of what investors might feel comfortable with. And certainly the bar for what makes a company completely non-investable is much lower in places like Europe and the US than I think it is in emerging markets. So outside of the US, there's a whole lot to look at. There's a ton of alpha out there, and it's not always that well hidden. Now, that being said, while there's less liquidity and a significant amount of different regulation, as well as the fact that what works in the US is not always easily translatable into Europe, I think it's a place that people want to spend more time and I think the juice is worth the squeeze.